David Mouche, President and CEO. I have Karen Riddell here, who is our CNE Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Wasim Saad, our Chief of Staff. David Mouche, President and CEO. I have Karen Riddell. That's <laughs> some feedback. Uh, so, welcome, everybody. This is not bingo. If you joined to play bingo, bad news, not bingo. Um, so, all seven of you can drop off now. No, um, so welcome everybody. Um, we're here to give you kind of, we're here to give you an update on uh, what's happening both here at Windsor Regional Hospital provincially, and then also with respect to the announcement today by the government regarding some more stringent uh, stay at home uh, orders um, that are in addition to what's been announced the last couple of weeks. So what I'm going to do at the start is go through uh, just a few slides, just give you an update because today, even though the science table did give um, somewhat of an update, uh, they did omit some important information or wasn't as clear on some of their slides to give you a context of what's going on provincially. Because I know here in Windsor-Essex, there's a feeling like things are half decent, not so bad. Uh, last couple of days, we've had some positive cases, but overall, it's been okay. Um, the rest of the province is literally underwater or on fire, whatever word you want to use uh, to describe that. So I'll go through these slides, and then some of you did provide some questions in advance. And if you want to provide some more questions, uh, please use the chat uh, function, and uh, you can type in your questions, and we will try to... Um, answer them. So I'm just going to pull up my screen. And here's the slide deck. So um, you'll see this is a slide that shows um, in all of the various public health units, the cases are rapidly increasing in most of them. The uh, blue lines are the April 11th numbers. The yellow lines are March 29th. So you'll see every single area, pretty much the blue areas uh, higher than the yellow area, which includes Windsor Essex is here um, as well, where our blue from uh, two weeks post and about a week ago is higher than it was at the end of March. Then if we look at the positivity rates across the province, um, you will see that Peel is running at 15% positivity rate, Toronto at 11%, York above 10. The Ontario average is uh, 7.9. And I'll go on another slide, you'll see what Windsor-Essex is at. But I can tell you, for example, the uh, positivity rate at our MET assessment center uh, yesterday, even though there was only 120 people being swabbed, um, over 20 were positive. So, um, you know, in effect, in one assessment center, we had a 20% positivity rate um, at the assessment center. So if you look at the seven day average for positivity rate in Ontario, we are hovering around 6% um, for the last seven days. And we are one of the higher um, across the province. But again, we're not to the point of Peel, Toronto, York. But unfortunately, um, we are in the top seven uh, positivity rates, which is not good. Um, and especially in light of the fact that we don't have a lot of testing going on. And people will ask, why don't we have a lot of testing going on? We have same day appointments or next day appointments. I think what happened is back in August, our community um, realized or came to the conclusion that the more positives we have, the longer we stay in a lockdown. Because if you remember back in August, we were locked down and the rest of the province was opening back up and we were still locked down. And our community hasn't forgotten about that. And as a result, um, there is a reluctance to get tested. And how we know that's happening is we're seeing patients coming into our emergency department who are highly symptomatic, 
um, and testing positive, um, and they did not seek a uh, swab before. So that's evidence number one. Number two is I hear it from people is people will indicate that, that they don't wanna artificially increase the rates in Windsor Essex, so they'll just ride it out um, if they are sick. Um, and number three, some people don't want to be indicated as sick because they don't want it on the record and they feel that's a negative impact upon them um, out in the community if they test positive to be positive for COVID. Um, and it would have some negative ramifications on them for, for testing positive. So I think all of those things coupled, even though we promote testing like nonstop, every chance Karen, Dr. Saad and myself have an opportunity to speak about it on TV, uh, radio and or um, to the public in any fashion, as well as public health, we promote getting tested if you're symptomatic. So what um, this slide shows is um, some very important data is in the province of Ontario, we have on the top left, uh, it shows we have just over 2,300 adult ICU beds um, that are available. These are base beds. And this uh, middle number indicates how many of those beds are occupied. This data is as of uh, April 14th, so it's a couple of days old. And it shows that we had uh, 1,200 non-COVID patients and 653 COVID positive patients. I think that number now is close to 700. Um, it's 680 something from what I recall. Uh, it's probably higher than that as I speak. So it's closing in on 700 of the 1800 or 1900 patients um, in the ICUs are COVID positive patients. Um, that means that 34.7% of our beds, our ICU beds are occupied by COVID positive patients. If we go back, um, they projected as of April 18th, Ontario Health projected we would have close to 700, 691 patients in our ICU COVID positive, and then projected by the end of this month, we would have 945. Well, it's April 16th, so within two days, that number will probably be passed, the 691. It'll probably be in the 700s for sure. And in this number over here, the 67% shows that 67% of our COVID positive patients who are in an ICU right now are vented, so close to 70%. Then they have the breakdown across the various regions and you'll see the central region has close to one out of every two patients in their ICUs are COVID positive uh, patients. Our region is west. We have uh, the second lowest at 26%. The north has the lowest at 16%. So um, that just shows the data as of two days ago and how, um, again, this number has gone up to close to 690. If you recall in wave two, the highest it got was 421 um, COVID positive patients in the ICU. So what happened after, sorry, wave two is the ICU numbers and inpatient numbers went down, but they plateaued. They never really dropped uh, to zero like they did after wave one entering wave two. And then they went up from there. So that's why we're at these numbers. So these are uh, very concerning numbers and they were referenced today uh, by the science table in their presentation and of course referenced by the government. So if we just look at what's been happening over the last two weeks in the province of Ontario, this blue line is um, the confirmed COVID-19 uh, positive patients. Again, in the ICU, that number is now understated, but you can see the dramatic rise uh, just over the last two weeks, 51% growth of ICU occupancy. Um, and then of course, 440 of them are on vents. Also during that same last two weeks, there's been a close to a 70% growth in hospitalizations. 51% uh, again growth in ICU occupancy. So dramatic, dramatic increases. Just for ourselves, uh, today we have at least 21, it might be 22 while we were getting prepped for this. I think we had another positive inpatient. I don't know if he was a previous positive, um, but we're at at least 21 inpatient positives. Um, six of them are um, 
I think in the ICU, five or six. Um, we, uh, last night, um, our team did a great job. We were able to have uh, Essex EMS attend a hospital in the GTA and uh, were able to take two uh, ward slash um, non-ICU patients COVID positive and bring them to Windsor. Um, our team admitted them here at Met. And then also today we took an ICU COVID positive patients from patient from London. So what's happening across the province right now is because of these numbers and because of the projections I'm gonna show you, the concern is capacity in these hotspot areas and their ability within that hotspot area to be able to handle the hospitalizations of COVID positive patients, let alone those requiring ICU care. So what the science table indicated today is there's four predictive models and all the assumptions were there. They had stay at home orders for four week period, a six week period, which is now in place. It's six weeks. They talked about vaccine assumptions. Right now we're doing provincially about 100,000 doses a day. Um, and then their models indicate over the next four weeks and the words that, uh, uh, that the science table used is they were asked, okay, if we go to a full lockdown today, will our ICU model predicted change? Will it get better? And the answer was no. What we have and what we're predicting is bait, meaning it, what's gonna happen in the ICUs in the next couple of weeks has already been decided. Uh, because it's, as we know, it's been decided on activity that took place probably at Easter um, or right after Easter. Um, and uh, that's what we're dealing with now. So they are predicting as of May 7th, instead of having 700 COVID positive patients in the ICU, that number is gonna be 1500. That's like our best case scenario. The worst case is at the bottom there, 2300. As stated on the previous slide, we only have capacity for 2300 ICU beds in the province, base beds. So that's why this is dire. That's why this is uh, something that the government has to deal with. That is why there's the stay at home order previously. That is why it was increased today. And that is why we have to help out the province and have patients relocated here to try to take pressure while at the same time balancing that with our own local needs. So right now, as stated, we're up to 21, 22 inpatients, um, three of which uh, were brought to us in the last 24 hours. The issue about critical care patients is Orange does all the transports of critical care patients in the province of Ontario. The issue for them sending a critical care patient from the GTA to us is it takes one of their trucks out of service for arguably eight hours, four hours to get here, four hours to get back. As a result, that's a long time period to have one of their trucks out of service. That's not to say we won't get critical care patients, but most likely where they're gonna come from is what happened today is they're from London. Some will go to London, critical care from London will go to us. That's most likely the, the way it's gonna transmit. That doesn't mean we won't get critical care patients from the G GTA. It's just because of the transport issue. So the way we looked at this is um, um, like a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, not a siphon, a uh, funnel. I don't know, I forget, like a funnel. So everyone's focusing on the bottom of the funnel, uh, what's coming out of the bottom, which is a critical care patients and how to relocate them in the province of Ontario and there's a lot of movement of critical care patients on a daily basis, multiple times a day to try to relocate patients. We're saying, why don't we look at the top of that funnel? So before a patient becomes a critical care patient, if there's transport issues, why don't we take the patients newly admitted COVID positive, about 25% to 40 to 50% of them get to the ICU anyhow, 
But if we can get them at the early stage of their illness, not requiring orange transportation, but our EMS can go pick them up, we can go pick them up, bring them back here and take care of them here in Windsor. And at the same time, that will eventually relieve pressure on someone's ICU at a minimum relieve pressure from a health human resources point of view and a capacity point of view. So that's what we're articulating with the province for our role to be um, because of our physical location, ourselves, Chatham, Blue Water, uh, Erie Shores to take on that same role because we all have quote, some physical capacity. Again, at the same time, having an eye on what's going on locally and balancing that out as best as we can. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, as you know, back just in January, when we were having difficulties, we relied upon other parts of the province to help us and they did. These are provincial beds. We have an obligation to take care of Ontario residents wherever they're from. And that's an important role that we play in the province of Ontario. And again, they played for us just a couple, three months ago. Um, so um, it's, it, we have to help them out as much as we can. Um, in this scenario, while at the same time having an eye to the local needs um, and, and trying not to prejudice our local needs as much as possible, considering over the last two days, we've had um, you know, a close to triple, triple digit uh, positive cases um, and then also uh, the increased inpatient activity um, we're starting to see, but nowhere near what Toronto is. And giving an example, Places like William Ozer, last time I checked, they have close to 200 COVID positive patients in their facility. Their facility is about the size of our Met and Alet together. And you remember when we had 80 positive COVID patients in our facility, what that was like. You could just imagine what 200 is um, in a facility that size, um, let alone uh, places like Troyum, similar, just COVID patients, dramatic numbers. Um, medical patients in the ICU. So that's what we're looking at and that's the way we're trying to help. Um, and that's a snapshot of, uh, of where we're at. Oh, 684, thanks uh, Karen for the update that was reported this morning. And I bet you it's close 700 right now, if not over 700 as we speak. So that's kind of where we're at. It's a dire situation for the province of Ontario. Um, oh, 701, there you go. So um, um, that was to everybody, Karen. So I think everyone sees that, no? Um, so no, they don't, just us. Oh, 701 folks. So um, there you go. So um, it's a dire situation um, for the province and that's why we're in the situation we're into. So some questions you, you folks have um, before I ask Karen and Wasim for some uh, opening comments too, is uh, visitor res restrictions. In the very near future, like in the next half hour, we're going to be sending out a memo that as a result of everything I just stated, we are going to be uh, going to no visitors except in certain very narrow exceptions. And the reason for that is first and foremost, there's a stay at home order um, that does have certain exclusions. Um, so we have to respect that. That's not driving this. But second of all, positivity rate. Third of all, the activity we're starting to see in our own hospital. Um, and not wanting to promote the spread of variants. We have the um, virtual assistants, they're ready to roll to help. Please, as staff, please work with families, rely upon the virtual assistant or yourself in order to communicate with families during a very stressful time. Um, so you'll be seeing that will be um, issued. Uh, we also had, you know, one of the questions I'll jump on it right now is with respect to, well, is some of the staff going to work from home? Right now, no, nothing has changed from this stay at order with respect to working at home or working at the hospital. So, um, and in addition, we just went live with uh, Cerner. So we still need staff here to help with that because we're only a week into it. Um, so that's number two. So before I hand it off to Karen, I want to talk about Cerner real quick. Amazing job, folks. You've done a great job getting uh, Cerner up and running. It actually went a heck of a lot better um, than, um, um, uh, than what um, I have uh, uh, seen 
uh, or what I was anticipating. Sorry, I'm trying to answer questions at the same time. And um, so amazing job with respect to that uh, yourselves. The other thing we're going to talk about is with Cerner, we are actively working with Transform. The idea was to have on-site support here for the first month. We're extending that to two months, not finalized yet, but just wanted to tell you that, that we're extending, we're working on, it's very close to extending it for two months. So you have on-site support here for another month. Um, you folks are doing a great job. I know it takes time to learn the system, but we all know the benefits of that system. A lot of you talked about it for years of the needs for an HIS system, um, an electronic system, and we finally got it and it's a good one and there's a ton of benefits from it. I know it's difficult to work through, so but you're doing a great job um, overall with respect to that. And um, as we work through the next month and two months, um, a lot of the issues will be sorted out. So kudos to all of you with respect to that. So before we answer more questions, I will hand it off to Karen for any opening comments. Uh, thank you, David. And thanks for everybody for joining us tonight. Um, uh, just before we move on, just to um, um, kind of leave kind of off, comment. Off, off of what uh, David was mentioning with regards to the Cerner launch. Uh, just preliminarily, our, our results are actually amazing. Um, the work that everybody has been doing. Um, I talked to uh, Lynn, who's our, our, our Cerner Evolve lead, um, and we were upwards of 85% uh, computer physician order entry today, which is, there's organizations that work for 10 years to get to that level. So um, we've got great results coming in. It's good for our patients and really, really do appreciate all the work that you've done. Uh, to get trained up and all the support that you're providing to each other. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, with regards to what David mentioned, um, we're um, actually in a good situation during this wave in comparison to the other two. Uh, we learned a lot during those first two, even though we were really struggling with the numbers in our community. So we're well situated right now. We have everything in place. Um, and our teams are, are ready to go and really supportive. Um, and we, the hospitals that we have been accepting patients from are so appreciative um, of our rapid uh, transport that we've been able to get the patients uh, down to us quickly. So um, we're, we're very glad that we're able to support um, other regions, like David said, that really supported us during the first two waves. So uh, we'll keep a close eye on it. Our operations table meets daily um, and looks at capacity across Erie St. Clair and we share that with the rest of the province uh, so they know where the capacity is and where they can send these patients so they can get care just to kind of give you um, a sense of what these hospitals are dealing with not just with their inpatient capacity but they have um, upwards of 50 and meant no beds in their emergency department um, the two patients that we transferred uh, the other day had both been in the emergency department for days so this is a situation that we're helping these hospitals deal with. There's hospitals in Toronto building field hospitals and tent cities basically outside to house patients. So it's really important that we're um, with these uh, additional provincial measures that we are able to um, put some additional restrictions in place to help slow the spread because it's, it's really it's really a dire situation in Toronto. So thank you for all that you do every day uh, for this hospital and this community, and we're gonna keep doing it and we're gonna get out on the other side of this. Thanks, Karen. Dr. Saad. Thanks, David and Karen, and thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, I'm not going to belabor the points anymore, but I think David and Karen said it all, um, just re-emphasizing how uh, this is one of the, uh, I think, hardest points during this pandemic for a couple of reasons. Number one, entering the third wave and at the same time, instituting a new HIS system. I don't think that's been done anywhere else. So we are record setters again in Windsor. Um, but this is something that so far has been going very well. Uh, we can consider ourselves fortunate in our area that we are not feeling the brunt of the third wave like everyone else is in the province. But as a result of that, we're going to act to help those others uh, that need it. Um, I think uh, everybody across the board has been very understanding. Obviously the surgical group, anesthesia group, knowing that we had to ramp down our surgeries. 
uh, the medicine group who stepped up to the plate to create COVID units to help care for the patients who are coming in from out of town. And of course, everybody else who's working extremely hard during the uh, HIS implementation, uh, which is a struggle on its own. But then when you combine that with, uh, with the, the, uh, the leading edge of the third wave, it's quite impressive. So thank you again for everything that you do. We're doing our best to try to keep you updated. This is one of the reasons why we have these town halls so people can speak their minds, get updated and get the answers that they're, uh, that they're looking for. So we're happy to be here and, and help out any way we can. Thanks, Dr. Saad. Um, so I'll just start with the questions. I'll deal with the ones online first. So uh, by um, submitting, by using the ambulances to go pick up those patients, the question is, um, are they gonna be out of service for the community? No, um, what happens is uh, EMS has quote extra staff um, that they deploy, I think it's upwards of 20 that are available to be deployed with equipment to um, do this. So what we wanna actually create is a system where we, so what happens is if you wait to get the call and work through the bureaucracy, by the time our folks leave, and this has happened in other jurisdictions to go pick up patients, they turn from quote ward patients to critical care patients and you don't even have enough time to, they, now you're flipping to a different hospital and a different service to transfer them. So what we're trying to get across to the province is what our EMS, both here, Chatham and Sarnia, Lambton, are willing to do is pretty much go drive up every morning, go park outside one of these hotspot hospitals, be there at around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, be able to get a patient at 11, 12 and come back. Um, immediately to avoid a situation where there is a patient that um, uh, starts going dramatically unstable. Clearly, if on their drive something happens, they have the ability to call other services and or, you know, stop on the way to a place like London and, uh, and deal with it if they had to um, that quickly. But um, that's kind of the concept we had is the numbers are staggering. And I know it's hard to wrap our heads around that right now in Windsor, Essex. We kind of lived through it a bit in wave two. Um, it felt like that on many days for, for you. Um, and that's what Karen you know, indicated. Uh, but what they're seeing is three, four times, five times larger than what we saw even in wave two. So if we kind of wrap our heads around that, the stress we were going through, multiply that by four or five, that's what they're going through. And they're just at the start. Um, considering those. So, so that's, uh, so that's not pulling, uh, um, pulling ambulance out of service here locally. Um, it's quote extra uh, capacity uh, in addition to what they have to service our needs locally. Second is a stay at home order. Could it last as long as six weeks? Our, uh, the visitation policy change? Yes, it could. Um, I don't know the answer to that right now. All I do know the answer to is we have to put it into place for all those reason I, reasons I indicated. We had an ethics review done of it that's supportive of the ethics review um, at this time. Again, we wanna, it's not even erring on the side of caution. Um, it's, it needs to be done. And um, we gotta try not to risk our visitors with COVID and or vice versa. Um, so I, I wish we didn't have to do this, but with the variants and not knowing um, the ability of it to spread more broadly, this is the best thing to do um, at this time. It, it hurts because we know how uh, negative impact it has by not having visitation. But I'm telling you for every email I get from a staff member who says we should have visitation, I get two from staff members asking me every time we need to stop visitation for the same reason that I outlined. And we keep balancing it with ethical uh, reviews. And then we said, you know what, we gotta do this. So effective 1201, same time uh, tomorrow morning, we will not have visitation except in very narrow circumstances. And all that's gonna be sent out in the next, uh, within the next, like I said, half an hour to an hour if it's not been sent out already. Uh, the next question, Karen, do you wanna take that one? It's about um, redeployment 
within units that occurred in um, wave um, one, but not in wave two. Do you want to explain that question and answer it? Um, yeah, so I'll just talk um, a little bit about some of the work that we're doing um, in preparation uh, for this uh, potential wave in Windsor, Essex. So I think everybody is aware that we did redeploy staff from uh, various areas throughout the hospital. So with the surgical ramp down, um, as that ramps down and as we uh, get through the first few weeks of Cerner, we will have uh, staff that we will be able to train and redeploy. So right now we are still using those staff in their home units um, to support uh, during Cerner, but we will uh, have more information for those departments on uh, uh, redeployment. At this time, we have very good capacity within the hospital, so there is no need uh, for immediate redeployment. So we're trying to hold off as long as we can um, so that we can continue to get used to Cerner and have a successful implementation. I will talk, um, there's a number of provincial initiatives that have been launched uh, during this wave. Uh, one of them, um, because I know that there was a question too about hiring um, uh, retired staff, uh, whether that was nurses or physicians. So there's a, a one program through RNAO that we're actually registered as um, an employer um, and they are actually actively recruiting um, retired and or um, um, critical care nurses that are looking for additional work or looking to help. So we are registered there um, within a 24 hour period. I had received notice that there were five uh, potential applicants. So that uh, is looking very promising. I think everybody's aware we've had um, uh, over 100 uh, university nursing students on site since the beginning of the pandemic. And we are, have been notified that that extern program will be continued to be funded by the government. So we are continuing with that. Um, and we're actively recruiting our new graduates um, that have been unis within the hospital. There's a great critical care uh, training resource um, that's been used uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and we've also done an on-site uh, updated our critical care training. So it does a combination of both virtual and clinical training. Um, and we have an actual shortened version. So for those staff that maybe work in PACU uh, or cath lab or CCU and might be going to an ICU setting, we have no plans for that at this point. We will talk to you before any of that happens but they're actually able to do an abbreviated version just to get um, a refresher of any skills that they need before going that area. And of course, uh, because we have Cerner now and you may not have had training um, in the specific area that you might be redeployed to, uh, the additional Cerner training would be provided. But that is not an immediate uh, thing that's happening. We will be uh, having further communication, so you'll be well informed uh, in your departments before any of that occurs. Um, and we'll certainly uh, try to do that uh, based on uh, a volunteer uh, perspective first. So um, when, we, um, when we're ready uh, to do that, we will reach out uh, to those departments and you'll get that information. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, and then I think the other one uh, was just about utilizing um, alternative staff. So looking at um, other disciplines, and that is part of the critical care um, alternative staffing model. So looking at um, working with um, additional RT staff, which we have done throughout the pandemic. So we hired RT students to help manage equipment. Uh, we have alternative physician staffing models as well, where anesthesia, internal medicine support uh, the ICU setting as well. Um, and then we also have our allied staff that help supplement uh, the staffing model. So when we're having to prone multiple patients, it's all hands on deck. So uh, those are great questions. Um, and certainly if you have additional suggestions, always feel free to send me an email. Uh, we're always willing to look at uh, unique ideas and we'll get through this together with those, uh, with a great team that we have here and um, uh, just keep sending in those ideas. They're much appreciated. Yeah, and I'm just uh, online, Dr. Saad. One of the questions is, uh, what about patients that refuse pre-op swabs? Are we still going to do the surgeries? Uh, so with respect to that, there is going to be an update coming very soon. Um, it, we were considered previously a low uh, community, a community with low transmission. 
And as a result, we were only testing and doing pre-op testings for high-risk individuals, and a lot of pediatric patients were exempt from that. But given what we're seeing in the province, as well as locally, with the numbers of uh, positives rising, our percentage rising, uh, and the concern with uh, all of these new variants of concern, um, as of next week, we will be testing everyone preoperatively. Uh, that includes pediatric patients. Um, and so it's, it's similar to the protocol that we had during the first wave and the second wave when our community rates were high enough. When it comes to somebody who's refusing a pre-op test, um, if, if it's an elective procedure uh, and it's part of our policies and, and they're refusing it, then they're not going to get their surgery. Um, if it's something obviously that has a clinical urgency to it and you really don't have a way around it because there's a medical need and you have to do the operation for the safety and the well-being of the patient, uh, then yes, we'll have to do it and of course wear appropriate PPE and take all the necessary precautions. Um, it's very rare for patients to refuse testing, especially after you've talked to them and explained the reason for the testing. Uh, we haven't run into that scenario very often. Um, but if it's an elective procedure, it's similar to somebody who comes into the assessment center wanting to be tested and refuse to wear a mask and doesn't have a medical reason to have a mask on because they're not following the policy and it's not an immediate threat to their, to their health, they're going to be refused uh, entry into the assessment center. So all patients are expected to follow the rules when they come into the hospital, unless there are extenuating circumstances. Thanks, Dr. Saad. I remember a story, uh, not a story, it's true. Um, where a patient had to, um, he called me at home, it was at night, and uh, he uh, asked about the validity of the policy, this pre-op swabbing. And um, so I ex explained to him what it was, and he said, you have documentation on this. So I sent him the documentation that talked about pre-op swabbing. I thought that's all he needed. He just needed, you know, that we didn't make this up. It's something we didn't make out of the blue. That's prevent the policy. So I said, listen, I'll hang up. I'll send it to you. Take a read of it. If you have any questions, follow up. Sure enough, half hour later, he calls me back up. I still don't want to do it. Um, you know, I don't care what the provincial policy says. And I said, well, I'm trying to understand what your concern is. And I, cause I explained the safety for himself, for us, for everybody. And he said, it's because your swabs implant a device in my nostril and you're going to be tracking me post-surgery. So I said, sir, you know what? I can't fix that problem for you. So I guess what's going to happen is your surgery is going to be delayed um, until there's no requirement to get swabbed and then we can do your surgery. So that's a true story, by the way. And I remember it happened like on a Friday night all the way into the night. So it's, that was, uh, Karen's not even laughing. So, uh, but in any event, um, it was seems laughing. So uh, that's pre-op swabbing. Uh, we answered the uh, uh, student question. Um, there, Pam, Pam liked that story. So um, uh, sending hospital, uh, the, the sending hospital sending staff for transport or are we in case things go bad? So Karen, I don't know if you wanna answer that with respect to patients that we pick up from um, other hospitals in the province and bring down here, non-critical care patients? The non-critical care patients? Non-critical care, yeah. Right, I missed the first part of the question though. Oh, are like, we- I like, can't see are, the question. Oh, is, uh, is our staff going mm. to go pick up the patients or yeah. is the mm -hmm. sending hospital sending their staff with the patient? Yeah, so, um, each situation obviously is gonna be unique, but uh, in, for the medicine patients, they are stable for transfer. Um, so um, the patients that we brought the other day, for instance, uh, just required uh, the EMS team. They did not require an attending uh, nurse or RT. Um, for those long distance transports, I think it's most likely that if patients do require an RN, RT, that they will be going to a closer hospital. Um, and similar to what David had mentioned earlier, uh, it would be more of a two-stage process. So maybe those patients would go to London and then we would decant from London. So really the, for these longer transports, they're looking at transporting medically stable patients um, that don't require an RN or an RT for the trip. So I hope that answers that. Uh, testing endo patients. We're seeing. 
Uh, so for endoscopy, it, uh, this is one of those areas where during the pandemic, it sort of went back and forth whether the procedure itself is aerosol generating or not. Because with surgical patients, the reason why we're doing it, it's we're, we're testing everybody before they get any type of general anesthesia uh, because there's a risk of aerosolization and spreading uh, the virus into the room, uh, both on intubation and extubation. When it comes to endoscopic procedures, um, they have now been deemed not to be aerosol generating by both the World Health Organization as well as um, uh, national uh, gastroenterology societies. Uh, so that's, it's not routine to test endoscopy patients before they come for their scopes. Uh, if that changes, obviously we'll update our policies and procedures. And obviously if somebody is considered high risk, they will be tested, but it's not going to be routine like it is with patients undergoing general anesthesia. Okay, thanks, Wasim. And then about getting patients back, I mean, at the point of discharge, we'll make those arrangements, those safe arrangements to get the patients back to um, uh, their home as, you know, we sometimes normally do, um, especially if they have no family to come and get them, um, which could be the case. So um, really give uh, the team a lot of credit last night. Uh, before the patients were pretty much in the trucks, uh, the EMS to come down here. Our staff had already contacted the families, um, had communicated with the families, because we have to, you know, as we all know, every patient admission is stressful. Um, COVID increases the stress. What increases even more is someone who lives in, you know, Etobicoke is now being told, you know, their loved one's not only in the hospital, but is being sent now to Windsor um, for their care four hours away. So I give the staff a ton of credit um, reached out to the families, you know, as of last night, talked to them before the patients were even here and then followed up last night and today, um, with respect to these patients. So, um, well, um, well done. Um, uh, oh, field hospital. So, um, that's always a, a good question. Will we be opening it again? I'll go first, Karen will go second, Dr. Saad will go third on that. Um, I hope not uh, because of the types of patients the field hospital would be able to take care of. Our concept all along for the field hospital from the start was to take post acute care COVID patients um, that were too sick to go home, but were post their acute phase of COVID. That flipped within like, 24 hours to take long-term care slash retirement home patients. And we did. Now we're still at that stage where it would take, it would be post COVID patients, um, not in their acute phase. Could that exist locally or provincially that we need to help? Yes. So arguably we could close down that vaccination center today and be up and running tonight or tomorrow with the uh, field hospital. Um, we had that ready to go. So um, I pray we don't have to open it, but I don't wanna say never. Um, so I don't know, Karen, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, just um, obviously it's good that we have it and it is ready to go uh, within a really quick turnaround if we needed to do that uh, for either our community or for another community. Uh, one of the, um, the benefits of the location, and I know we've talked about this before, but it just um, reminds me as I see the hospitals in the GTA putting up their field hospitals that are outside, they're tents, they're exposed to the environment. We're very lucky um, that we've had such a great partnership with St. Clair to have the sports flex. Um, I mean, basically since the beginning of the pandemic um, and all of the great things we've been able to use it for. So it's ready. Um, we hope we no, don't have to use it, but if we do, uh, we've got it there to fall back on. So that's all I've got to say. I also have my field hospital t-shirt on today too, though. <laughs> Just keep it covered up. Um, okay, Dr. Saad, do you want to add anything about the field hospital? I'm just going to go out on a limb and make a prediction that we are not going to need the field hospital again. Thank you, Obi-Wan. Field hospital, no. Okay, hospital field, no. All right, um, let's talk, let's switch gears to some vaccine news. 
So um, we did some calculations of uh, the percentage of our staff that has been vaccinated with first and also first and second dose. Um, we were very fortunate, a couple things is number one, we were fortunate to get both Pfizer, Moderna, and eventually AstraZeneca in our community for use. We're one of the few communities that got all three. As a result, and as a result of some of our um, uh, aggressive moves in a sense of ensuring that you folks had access to the vaccine, um, and because of some outbreaks that were happening that other uh, institutions couldn't get the vaccine, we have a very high vaccination rate for our staff. It's uh, for our employees, it's uh, about 83%. Um, with the majority of them have gotten, we're able to get first and second dose already. Um, and some are waiting for second dose and they'll start by the end of June, second dose will start. So that's very positive. On the professional staff side, that number is even higher. Um, it's over 90%. Um, so that's uh, very, very positive um, with respect to our professional staff as well. So that's very good. Um, up to this point, knock on wood, very limited cases of staff um, still testing positive after one dose, after two weeks post one dose, um, nothing after two doses. Uh, that's not to say it won't happen because again there's still a chance percentage wise after one dose or even after two doses and then how long that lasts and i don't know dr sod if you want to kind of talk about the uh projected quote immunity so far with respect to um the pfizer vaccine what's out there and also for our staff regarding astrazeneca um, and anything you know, even about Johnson and Johnson. So, uh, well, what I would say again, as you said, it's great that we have such a high vaccination rate in our hospital. It's great that we are getting uh, as many as we are in the community, at over 100,000 in Windsor, Essex, and maybe one of the reasons why we've been in a relative bubble so far. Uh, the one dose of the mRNA vaccines, whether that's Pfizer or Moderna, has been shown to offer immunity f um, up to 80%. Uh, and now we know that the immunity lasts at least six months. Uh, that's with, with the second dose from the trials that we know. Uh, with respect to AstraZeneca, uh, obviously a lot of bad press uh, coming out of Europe and uh, a lot of ha vaccine hesitancy as a result of it. Um, but we do know that it is 100% effective at keeping you out of hospital and keeping you from dying. Uh, it does carry a risk of thrombosis, but that thrombosis risk is been deemed to be extremely small. In fact, this past week, Thrombosis Canada, which is sort of our national um, uh, guideline experts on, on thrombosis management, put out is trying to put out a public service um, message and trying to get out to uh, physicians what the relative risk is. And when you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine itself, the risk is about four in a million. If you are a woman on birth control, your risk is about 900 in a million. And if you're hospitalized with COVID, your risk of getting a blood clot is over 1,400 out of that million, it's 14%. So there's no question that there's a very small risk, but we're talking about a four in a million chance. And most of that risk is front loaded to patients that are under the age of 55 and predominantly women, uh, which is why if you are over 55, which is what the government of Canada is recommending, uh, and you get offered the AstraZeneca vaccine, please take it. It is safe. Your risk of having a blood clot is actually lower than your risk of having a blood clot if you were hospitalized and much lower than having uh, COVID itself or having uh, adverse effects from, from COVID infection. Uh, and immunity with both um, the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson also appear to be uh, several months. We, we, the estimates in the trials are anywhere from three to nine months. So these do offer us enough of protection for us to get over this third wave and possibly reach herd immunity uh, so that we can uh, finally uh, end this thing. Um, and the advantage to Johnson & Johnson, I don't know if uh, you mentioned it already, but it's, it's a single shot, it's one and done, it's easy to, to transport. 
which is why that it's going to be a game changer in some of the underserviced areas, third world countries. Uh, because again, as we we're realizing right now in Ontario with how we're trying to step up to the plate to help our province, this is a global problem and it's not just about Windsor Essex, it's about everybody. Thanks, um, Dr. Saad. So I'm going to start the math quiz right now. Um, so you might have heard today that um, the government announced have some issues with Moderna. So the Moderna shipments haven't been that great from the start and they just keep getting worse. So that's been put off the extent to that. Who knows? Pfizer, just so everyone knows, this is where Karen doesn't like the math, but I'm going to just go through it real quick, is the province of Ontario, starting like last month and this month, um, is getting about a million doses, I mean, sorry, Canada is getting a million doses a week, all of Canada. The province of Ontario gets about half of that, 500,000, 490 and change, okay? We get 10,000 of that, Windsor-Essex. So that's what we've been getting and that's what we're projected to get all of April every week and all of May every week is 10,000 a week. We're taking that 10,000, Windsor Regional keeps five. It's been varied, but we keep five and we run St. Clair and downtown with the 5,000 a week. So a thousand a day now for five days. And then uh, public health takes the rest, the other five and does WFCU sometimes out Leamington, Amherstburg, some community stuff um, that they're using the Pfizer for. So it kind of bounces around. What we heard today on Pfizer is the government brokered another deal where they are gonna get 8 million extra doses, hopefully extra, extra doses of Pfizer starting in May. They're gonna get four more million in May and then a couple million in June and a couple million in July. What that does for us in month of May, instead of getting 4 million doses, we're gonna get 8 million doses. So instead of us getting, arguably, this way it should work, 10,000 a week, we're gonna get 20,000 a week sometime in May. So in effect, our doses and the amount of first doses we can do will be doubled. Um, we'll be able to move through those age groups and those priority groups that much faster. And also a good chance we'll be able to start second doses sooner than the end of June. No guarantee yet, but with that, we should be able to. Um, so that, that's very positive um, for that to happen. So hopefully that all rolls out the way I just outlined. Um, that would be great. Um, what complicates all of our lives is the work that is happening in the background with respect to these vaccines is off the charts. Uh, meaning the amount of people that are involved in scheduling people, it's very simple. If this was all age groups, very simple online, people can book. You're above 80, you go online 70, 60, 50. If we did nothing but ages, it wouldn't be that hard to book. You just say you're 50, book. Um, if you're not, you know, show up with your ID, if you're younger and 50, sorry, come back when your age group hits very simple. That's not the case. They have all these specialty groups. So the only way we can get sometimes these specialty groups is we have to ask for that information from them in effect, pre-register and then call them to book their appointment because we got to verify it's them. So we got to verify it's someone who has a kidney problem. So the only way we can find that out is that's gotta be verified from a physician. We gotta get the name, we gotta call the person. So you can imagine just even a thousand people a day, booking a thousand people a day as a thousand phone calls a day, just for one day of bookings. Multiply that by weeks, it just it's never ends. So the staff have done an amazing job with that, keeping track of all these various lists, because every time there's a quote shortage of vaccines, they add another quote special population that needs this vaccine. So even with postal codes, it gets complicated. It's just, it's coming at them from 50 different angles. And at the end of the day, we got 5,000 vaccines a week. Um, so demand outstrips supply. And uh, it's just, um, it's, it's wild. Um, so uh, I have to give the team a ton of credit um, 
And uh, as you can tell, Karen gets upset when I start talking about numbers and how many vaccines, because we have this pretty much daily meeting um, since December the 16th at 8.30 in the morning, where we have a team together and we go through every single, what our vaccine levels are, who we're booking, um, what is our facilities like? What is our staffing like? What are the issues? Are there any issues we've got to resolve? Um, we got to look at possibly future sites and get those up and running. Uh, because just in case school comes back in the fall, we're going to still be doing this in the fall. So um, we're not going to be probably out of this business until well, you know, into 2022. Um, so we have to think about that already. We've got to think about what January 2022 looks like. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, so the article was uh, prevent uh, uh, vaccine tourism. I think that was blown out of proportion. Um, is it's happening? We can't prevent it. Um, so if you if you go online now, you'll see uh, WeChu has a site, um, and it has all the various categories that people have to sign up for. And what we're trying to do now is people have to indicate which jurisdiction they live in, but we can't prevent someone from London or Toronto for that matter for coming down here and getting a vaccine. We can't say, no, you're from London or Toronto. They can come, uh, they're from Ontario. So um, is there Windsor people going to their jurisdictions? Yes, probably, you know, I talked about all the benefits we had of having all those vaccines. Uh, one of the benefits is we're going to draw people from other jurisdictions that they're not even close to our age groups and they come down here to get vaccinated because they can get it quicker. But has it been a lot? No, I, I think that was kind of blown out of proportion. Um, I could see if people were coming from the states getting vaccines, that's a problem. So um, for every, you know, say it's 20% of the people from London are coming here to get vaccinated. We probably got 10% going to Chatham and London are 5%, so it's, you know, it's kind of a wash um, in the grand scheme. The goal is we wouldn't be having any of these discussions if we had more vaccines. We wouldn't be talking about delaying second doses. We wouldn't be talking about special populations. We would just be blowing through age groups. We'd be going 80 plus, 70 plus, 60 plus, 50 plus, and just like the state is doing now, you're 18 or 16, you're older than that, you gotta walk in and get vaccinated. Um, so that's basically where they're at right now. Now on the quid pro quo of that is look at their vaccination rates. They're not that good. I mean, they're going to cap out, uh, probably nationally at, you know, 50%. Um, and Michigan's not good at all, um, with respect to vaccination rates. And that's why, you know, it's pretty much walk in and get vaccinated. They have very low, I think their vaccination rates, ours already in Windsor, Essex is higher than uh, uh, Detroit and some of the outlying suburbs um, already. I mean, we're closing in on, um, uh, you know, over 30%, closing in on 40% of first dose. So, um, so that's probably where it's at. Um, and Dr. Saad, you were corrected on your math. You notice. I don't have access to the chat. What, what's the... Oh, it says 14 in a million is 1.4%. You said 14%. I was going to correct you too, but I don't want to embarrass you. So, it, it, okay, so it is 14%. So okay. the actual rate of thrombosis in a hospitalized COVID patient is 147,000 in a million, which is actually 14.7%. So you are only partially wrong. I was right with the percent. I may have said, did I say 1,400? 14,000. Yeah, it's 14,000. What I actually meant to say is 147,000, and the actual number is 14.7%. There you go. You corrected yourself. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> um, Karen, there's a question here. Many of our seniors are not getting the home care from community supports, thus increasing the ED admissions. So um, I do know that. Um, Home and community care is actually at our operations table um, and they are actually um, increasing the numbers of home and community care that are in the hospital um, as well as in the community. So they're helping to bolster the efforts. So ensuring that as they support the hospitals, as we go through this potential search, that they're also helping in the community 
um, during the first wave. That was um, one of the lessons learned as they redeployed uh, staff from home and community care into other settings. And then people that needed services in the community really suffered. So um, I suggest if you know people in the community that require home and community services and are not getting those, that they do reach out um, um, to their uh, care coordinator because they should be getting service. And certainly we're working very hard to avoid uh, emergency department visits and hospitalization. Yeah, so Giselle, we'll take that offline um, for Mary and if you can get some more details on who exactly that applies to, we can um, send that information on. Um, so um, we'll see. We were just told with seeing we're both correct. So you're correct and I'm correct the call that you were wrong, so. I would never wanna argue math with you, David, that's for sure. No, no, because I'll confuse you. I'll just <laughs> pretend I know the answer. That's how I got an A in math in high school. Fake it. Um, so uh, question is regarding vacation and uh, vacation planning for 21, 22. As many rescinded vacation in 2021 to support the staffing needs. Um, it's with respect to vacations for 2021 and 2022 being flexible with respect to booking, rescinding, um, et cetera. So I don't know, Karen, if you wanted to take a look at that one. Sure. So I think um, I think one of the challenges with the lockdowns that we all experience is even if you have vacation booked and you can take it, that people are are hesitant to actually take the vacation because they can't go anywhere, they can't really do anything. So um, I think that lessons learned in that first wave is that people do need their vacation. So uh, we will certainly be encouraging people if they have vacation booked. Um, and we're not, you know, in a, a surge event with massive human resources challenges that people do take their vacation, um, that they do have allotted. Uh, we need to maintain our, both our physical health as well as our mental health uh, during uh, COVID. This has been a very long haul for all of us. Um, so we're certainly, um, I know that the vacation planners are done for uh, this, this uh, new calendar year. So would encourage people that even if you can't go anywhere, get the rest, spend the time with your family, if that's restful for you, um, and just do some things at home, even if you can't go away because you need that decompression time. Um, and certainly we are uh, able to uh, provide some flexibility. We did that last year as well when we had some downtime uh, uh, for a short period. Um, uh, in between surges, we did encourage as many people as possible to take time off. Um, so we'll just have to play it by ear. Um, we'll have to see how this wave goes. So if you've got uh, vacation booked over the next uh, few weeks, I can't really speak to that, but uh, hopefully by the later summer, um, we'll be back to maybe some more semblance of normalcy um, and should have a lot of vaccines um, out there in the community getting to that herd immunity like uh, Dr. Saad mentioned. Um, and uh, hopefully one day getting to travel again because <laughs> something that I miss very much. So, but um, we still do need to take vacation. So that's a great question. Please do. Yeah, so next question, uh, here's the loaded one. What, what was the reason we fell behind the US in vaccinations to begin with? I got an answer to that. You wanna go with yeah. C? You don't wanna answer that? So here's my answer. Um, Canada bought a lot of vaccine. I think out of all the countries in the world, we were ranked as the country that bought the most vaccines uh, per capita. We bought enough for my, and probably now it's even more because of what we bought recently with Pfizer, um, is at least seven times our per capita population, meaning we can all get vaccinated seven doses of whatever vaccine. So we have a ton of vaccine at some point. The problem is, is sounds like a few things happened. Number one is I, I, I like horse racing. 
we bet on the wrong horse. So we bought a lot of vaccine, but we bet on a horse that hasn't even left the starting gate yet. So there's some of the vaccine we bought that's still within phase two, phase three trials, may never hit the open market. Um, and as a result, that money was spent, uh, again, we bet on the wrong horse. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, sounds like a lot of our contracts, because we didn't think the vaccine was going to be available until the first, the end of the first or start of the second quarter of this year, a lot of our contracts never contemplated it was going to be available as early as December of 2020. So the contracts we negotiated that haven't seen the light of day yet, probably at some point in our lifetime will, sounds like they were all framed to not get our first big deliveries until the end of the first quarter or second or third quarters of this year. And they were done by quarters, not monthly. Well, the companies, when you do that, are gonna guess what? When you say you get your delivery uh, by the end of the first quarter, they're gonna give it to you in the last week of the first quarter. And that's what happened. Um, so that's the uh, second thing um, that happened is bet on the wrong horse, bought some product that probably will never make it to market. And in negotiation of the contracts, we did it by way of quarters and um, not demanded more. I mean, um, it sounds like they brokered a deal with Pfizer, which is great. I, you know, I, I don't know the intri intricacies of it, but again, when we had to search for PPE, short of us jumping on a plane, we had someone on site there trying to get that PPE for you, for the staff in our community and we got it and took a big gamble. Um, I don't know. I'd be on a private me personally. And you, I, I respect the office of the prime minister. I'd be on a private jet, private jet, of course, to Belgium. And I'd be pulling into the president CEO's office of Pfizer with a few dollars in my pocket. And I'd be saying how much it's going to cost for that private jet to be loaded up with some uh, vaccines I can take back to Canada. Sounds like they just did that. So um, kudos to them for doing that. But We'll see. So that's my answer on why we're falling behind the U.S. in vaccines. And also, we don't have on-site manufacturing. That's a killer too, right? So the U.S. has uh, Pfizer two and a half hours away at Kalamazoo. We don't have a Pfizer. We don't have a Kalamazoo and we don't have a Pfizer. So we have Pfizer, but... Um, I don't know for the last, it never was retooled or we have plants. Um, I guess there's a large one in um, Quebec, but I, I don't know how active there was discussions with respect to getting that up and running to uh, pump out uh, the vaccine here domestically. So there will be years and years and years of audits and all sorts of good stuff that all these stories and books will be written about what happened during this time period or didn't happen that we'll all get to relive it for the rest of our lives. So, but hopefully we learn from it. So I don't know, it's closing in on 7.43. So we've uh, been at this. Uh, some closing words, Dr. Saad. I don't really have much more to say. Uh, I think we've sort of said it all in some of the questions that we've answered. I think it's great that we had such a great turnout of people asking questions, interested to know what's going on and very thoughtful questions that uh, I think really speak to how invested people are and how interested they are in, in the uh, ultimate outcome. Uh, but the most important thing that I've said earlier is I think, you know, right now at the hospital, we have both the uh, Cerner go live as well as the beginning of the third wave that's really going to test us over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I do think that after the next two to three weeks, let's say a month to be safe, uh, we are going to be over the hill, both from a, a computer program perspective, as well as from uh, the worst of the third wave, I think. And again, David's going to disagree with me because he thinks that their third wave is going to last until 2022. Uh, but I do think at the end of the summer, things are going to start to, uh, in midsummer, things are going to start to to level off. And by the end of the summer and early fall, I think things are going to come back to normal. But we are definitely going to be tested the next couple of weeks 
next few weeks for sure. So stay strong, be safe, look after each other, and uh, we're, we're going to make it through it together. Karen? Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Saad, the hard act to follow there, I'll just, um, just to, um, I'll keep it short and sweet, just exactly what Dr. Saad said, stay safe, uh, take care of each other, we'll get through this, and uh, we'll get out on the other side, and hopefully this will be our last wave. So thanks for everybody joining tonight. Yeah, and thanks everybody. Um, as Dr. Saad and Karen stated, I mean, I, I really can't believe we're in this post a year and we're still in this post a year. Uh, when people asked me back last March, February, March, when this started, how long did I think it was going to go? I said September, October um, at the time. Um, people were like, oh, I'll be over in June. I said, oh, I don't think so. I think it's going to last till at least September, October. If someone were to bet me uh, last February, March and say, we'd be talking to you folks about this and we'd be in the midst of a third wave like we are, I would have been, wow, really? I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, but then again, if someone said we'd be doing how many vaccines as we've done uh, back in February, March, a year from now, I wouldn't believe them either. So, um, or we swabbed over 100,000 people. I wouldn't have believed them then either. So uh, kudos to all of you folks. I mean, everything we've, every challenge you've been confronted with, uh, you've met with stars. I got an email from the president and CEO of Ontario Health the other day who indicated to me, he just said, your team has stepped up to the challenge um, each and every day and has been, holds us, is very proud uh, face on the province and what your team's done um, in Windsor, Essex and Windsor Regional Hospital. So that's, uh, I wanted to end on that that that's directly related to all of you. Kudos to all of you. I know it's tough. I know we've all exhausted, like to the point it's we're past that point. Um, but if you can try to take some time for yourself and your family, you know, one of the benefits we had when we were in total kind of lockdown last time, uh, back a year, from, a year ago that we're in now is we're able to spend a little more time with our family. Um, and, uh, so hopefully you can take that opportunity right now um, and do that and, um, and uh, cherish it because we know how fragile life is um, and how difficult it is. And you folks know the patient stories. Karen told me the patient story today about the gentleman we got from uh, London, which is just tragic. And um, life is uh, very delicate. So hang in there. Um, we're going to get through all of this together. We will be much better and much stronger on the other end of it. So please hang in there. Um, we're doing well. Y you know, you, you folks, you came to the challenge to get vaccinated. Um, you know, our flu vaccine rates were like 40%. That's a good year. So you more than doubled that. So that's amazing. Uh, that's keeping yourself safe, your family safe, and our community safe by doing that. So kudos to all of you. And uh, for those waiting on the second dose, we'll work our butts off to get that second dose in your arm as quickly as we can. But as Dr. Saad stated, you're well protected with the first dose. And uh, the proof of that is playing out with respect to what we're seeing um, as a result of uh, reinfections. So hang in there. Um, we're going to get through this together again. Keep it, uh, keep the lines open and, and we'll plug through this. All I would suggest because of the issue about police stopping you, um, possibly, um, just have your hospital ID with you all the time when you're leaving here or coming here. I know you do anyhow, but have it with you so you can uh, flash your ID to the police officer and indicate you're coming to work or leaving work. Um, and I am hoping that when I get pulled over, I get arrested and put in jail for a couple months. Um, that's my goal. And I come out of this in July and see you folks in July. So I don't care. You, no, we'll you out same day. Don't worry. <laughs> you don't have your hand up. That was a, a, a legacy hand as they call it in zoom world. All right. Well, Thanks, bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Keep it up. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody.